Hello and thank you for joining us for this episode of the Onc Live Peer Exchange. This video series features expert panel discussions of current and emerging therapies in the treatment of hematologic malignancies. I'm Dr. Gary Schiller. I'm professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Today I'm joined by a distinguished panel of physicians and researchers who will offer their clinical insights and reflections on recent advances and ongoing challenges in the treatment of patients with ALL, CLL, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. With me is Dan Dewar from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, where he is the leader of the research program in adult acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Also here is Steve Hunger, Professor of Pediatrics, Director for the Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders at the University of Colorado. Also on my right is Brad Kalp, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin and Director of the University's Lymphoma Service. Mike Lill is Professor of Medicine and Medical Director of the Blood and Marrow Transplant Program at the Ocean Comprehensive Cancer Institute at Cedar sinai Medical Center. And with us also is John Bird, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Division of Hematology at The Ohio State University. Thank you all for being here today. Let's begin with a review of the challenges we face in treating patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia and recent advances to help in their care. I'd like to ask about ALL. It's an aggressive cancer of the blood and bone marrow, and it's the most common cancer diagnosed in children. Worldwide, ALL accounts for more than 12% of leukemia. While cure rates are approaching 90% in the pediatric population with ALL, the same cannot be said for adult patients. There are unmet challenges in ALL, which include determining an optimal way to sequence new drug combinations and how much cumulative exposure is necessary to maintain durable responses. I'd like to ask the panelists what we know about the epidemiology of ALL today vis-a-vis -vis the risk factors, age of diagnosis, and so on. Maybe Steve or Dan, you can begin. Thanks very much, Gary. Uh, Overall, about half of ALL cases occur in children and about half in adults. And we see a peak incidence of occurrence between three and five years of age in children. Uh, as you said earlier, the cure rate for children with ALL is approaching 90%, but that really begins to drop in mid-adolescence. So the older adolescent and young adult fares definitely worse than younger children, particularly children younger than 10. And then I think uh, Dan can comment more uh, accurately on adults with ALL. Uh, ALL in adults uh, expands a, a wide range of ages. Uh, some uh, are treated by adult oncologists from the age of 15, and patients are all the way to age 60. So it's very hard to, to treat this wide range of, of age groups uh, with the same uh, treatment. In fact, today, uh, we distinguish between patients who are young adults, usually saying those are uh, patients that are younger than 39, and then older adults, so the patients are 60, and the real older adults that are uh, patients above 60. And it, it appears that each one of those uh, subgroups may need a different type of uh, treatment, which makes uh, establishing a standard uh, very difficult. Well, at this meeting, again, there is an abstract that talks about applying pediatric regimens to adults. And I want to ask both of you the long-standing and controversial question. Do young adults do poorly because of disease biology or because we adult hematologists, oncologists are treating them rather than expert pediatricians like Dr. Hunger? Well, I think there's several factors that explain the poorer outcome of young adults. Uh, the first definitely is a change in biology, and you see this really starting in the teenage years where the favorable genetic subtypes that we see in young children really start to get much less common and really almost disappear in the early 20s. And I'm speaking specifically about children with uh, favorable chromosome trisomies or patients with favorable chromosome trisomies or patients with favorable translocation, such as the ETB6 Runx X1. In parallel, the occurrence of bad acting subtypes, such as Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL, starts to increase. So really, if you look at the spectrum of biology of a 25-year-old with ALL, it's very different than the spectrum of biology of someone five to 10 years of age. 
And I think uh, you know you, you refer to the abstract that's being presented from from the CA10403 trial. Uh, they're not yet the data are not yet mature enough to talk about outcome, but I think the striking part of that abstract is really that the side effects of so-called pediatric inspired therapy in young adults are really no different than the side effect profile that we see at least in children over eight to 10 years of age. So I think that that's very encouraging that this therapy can be delivered by adult oncologists to patients between about 15 and 40 years of age equally safely to it can be uh, delivered to children and adolescents. Uh, considering the different epidemiology of uh, cytogenetic abnormalities in adult ALL, what are some of the new things that are coming our way in terms of change in treatment options for adults with these high risk and aggressive ALLs? Well, I would say that adults, uh, most, all of them are considered high risk patients. But if you, the most common cytogenetic abnormality in adults, which is very rare in children, is the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, it increases with age. I would say know, overall it's 25 percent of adults, but patients who are 55 or 60, uh, half of them are Philadelphia positive. And uh, the, the treatment of this uh, subtype of ALL is, is really uh, discussed separately. It's, it's taken out of the main uh, treatment of other ALLs, and now we consider differently the treatment of adults with Philadelphia negative ALL and those with a Philadelphia positive. And, and that's mainly due to the fact that uh, for patients who have this abnormal Philadelphia chromosome, we have a very specific drug that targets uh, these genetic rearrangements, which are uh, imatinib or nilotinib, which have really have uh, improved uh, the outcome uh, significantly to the point that we may not need even transplant. I think that's in children shown. And may, we may not need the same chemotherapy that we're using for other uh, uh, types of ALS. So I think we really have to make a clear distinction between those are Philadelphia negative and positive patients. Okay, so.